Well, good morning, and welcome on this wonderful Sunday. This is the last Sunday before Lent begins. So that's what it is. <laughs> if you could sign the attendance pads and pass them down, that would be great. Thank you for doing that. Our prayer focus this week is for those who are homeless and those dealing with mental issue. Uh, it's a tough situation throughout not only our county, but our state, our world, our nation. There's a lot of homelessness. It seems to be getting worse. A lot of it is attributed to mental illness. So we just want to pray for those people and the opportunities that are out there. And tomorrow morning at 8.30, we'll be meeting over in the corner there to pray. Um, but I won't be there because I got a doctor's appointment at tomorrow morning at 8.30. But y'all can gather and pray without me because you've done it sometimes. As I've gotten into my 60s, my number of doctor's appointments is rising exponentially from my 40s. But I'm speaking to the choir, okay? So I'm not... Um, this weekend, Friday and Saturday, is when we are taking pictures. So if you've signed up, we are going to be taking the pictures then. We are going to, on Wednesday, send out an email to everybody who signed up to remind them what day and time they signed up. And then hopefully we're going to call you. That's my goal this week, is to let you know when you signed up for a picture. And they're Friday and Saturday. And I need four volunteers. I kind of let this slip up, asking for volunteers. I need four people who can come check people in. So you can be there for maybe three hours and another person for three, because I think it's six hours on Friday and six hours on Saturday. And the just main thing is there is to check people in and give them whatever thing they have to fill out and send them to a table to fill it out and wait to be called to get their picture taken. If you could do that, it would be a great help to me, because if nobody volunteers, then I've got to do it, so. And, which I can, but then I can't do it while I'm getting my picture taken, so. So if you can help me out, that would be a great thing. And also we have, for those who haven't signed up, we have one more slot on Saturday, and then there we've added a, a third day on March 14th, a Tuesday. If you would um, like to sign up that, I'll be in the back there, and we can sign up. I think there's seven more slots on Tuesday and one on Saturday. Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday, the 22nd. We'll be having a service here at 6 p.m. to begin our, our remembrance of Lent. And so I invite you to come to that. March 1st, we'll be having the start of our Wednesday night renewal dinner and study. Um, also on March 1st, we are going to invite the nomads to that dinner too because their, that Thursday, March 2nd, is their last day here and they'll be moving on. And we just want to thank them for that. So hopefully everybody can come that Wednesday night and we'll start our things and have celebration. Next Sunday is coffee with the pastor. Oh yeah, we have a sign-up sheet back there. Please sign up for the Wednesday night thing. The next Sunday we have coffee with the pastor. If you are interested in joining the church or information about the church, at about 10.15 we meet in my office, so you'd need to come a little early. And... Uh, we just talk about what it means to be in the church. And then on March 7th, which is a Tuesday, we have the Indiana Wesley University's Wind Ensemble is coming to perform here and give a concert. And they'll be performing, I think, at 7 o'clock, 6.30. I'll have the time, we'll have the time in the newsletter, in the e-minder, in the newsletter. But it's a wonderful thing to invite friends to. They're going to come through here. They're doing a, a tour probably during their spring break, and they're going to work one of their stops. There's 40-some members in the Wind Ensemble, so it'll be a wonderful time. I was trying to visualize how I get 40 instruments up here. They might spill down into the floor, because other pictures I've seen, all the percussions down here. But it'll be a wonderful time, so I invite you to put that on your calendar March 7th. Well, at this time, let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Amen. This time, let us stand for our call to worship. The Lord reigns. The Lord is great in Zion. And exalted over all the peoples. Let us praise God's great and awesome name. Holy And let's continue standing and open with our opening hymn number 278, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. doing the affirmation from Romans. Please repeat the words on the screen after me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
and you may be seated. <clears throat> we come now to the time where we lift up our prayer requests and our praises. And one of the praises this morning was Kathleen, who had the brain surgery a couple weeks ago, was in service on this morning at the 9 o'clock service, and she was looking good and just thanking everyone for prayers. It's hard to believe that they cut into her brain just two weeks ago, and here she is worshiping with us today. So she's praising God, and that is a praise. Other praises this morning. You prayed, you're, you're, back you, you made it back from Georgia. <laughs> yes, the roads can be crazy these days. Yes. Yeah, well, that's a praise that you can make those connections again. That's a praise. Other praises? Or any prayer request? Everything's just going good with everyone. That's, a <laughs> that's where we want to be. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you this day, we come with thankful hearts. We want to, Lord, just be filled with your power, your presence. We want to be filled with your love and your grace. And so, Lord, help us to empty ourselves this morning in praise to you. Help us to leave here in this church all our troubles, all the things we worry about, all our pains, Lord. Lord, help us to bring them and set them at the feet of the altar, at the foot of the cross, where you will take them, Lord, and free us from them so that we can leave this place renewed, refreshed, and made whole again, Lord. Do that. Fill us with that newness. Fill us with your love. And gracious Heavenly Father, as we come here this morning, we lift up the homeless not only in our community, but in our state and nation and worldwide. Lord, many are dealing with it because of mental illness. Many are dealing with it because of things they did. And others, Lord, because of just the circumstances of life went bad. But Lord, they find themselves homeless, and Lord, we lift them up to you. And we ask that you open our eyes and ears to the ways that we can touch their lives, that we might help them. We thank you for ministries like Family Promise and Love, Inc. that work so hard to help those that are in homeless to restore them. So, Lord, bless those ministries and help us to continue to work with them. But, Lord, also show how else we might help them. But, Lord, bless them wherever they are. And, Lord, also this morning we come lifting up those that are hurting, those that need your healing, your strength, your, your just restoration. We lift up all of those that are on our prayer list, Lord. We ask that you be with them. And Lord, we thank you that Kathleen is doing so well from the brain surgery and that she was here to praise you today and continue to heal her. But we lift up all of those on our prayer list, Lord. And we even now, Lord, lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. <clears throat> And gracious Heavenly Father, help us to be your church, to be your people in this community. Lord, we can only do that as we are filled by your Holy Spirit. Can we leave this place and share your love with those we meet? We thank you for the purpose you have given each one of us and the purpose you have given this church collectively. Help us to hear, to understand that call in our lives, Lord. Help us to hear your voice, to listen to it each and every day so that we might know the hope you have for us, the joy you have for us, 
the love you have for us, Lord. So speak to us. Because, Lord, we are listening this day. And, Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ who makes our listening possible, who makes our going and doing possible, who took all of our wrongs to him so that we could come before you today blameless and whole. We thank you for his presence, his gift, his love. We now close the prayer and the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite our children to head over to Children's Church, and they'll go through the double doors there, and they'll return at the end of the service. And for all those who are children at heart, we can continue singing. What a friend we have in Jesus, number 526.
Amen. We are blessed each week with our music. We now come to that time where we lift up our tithes and offerings. <clears throat> this week as we are taking up an offering for Blanket Sunday, and we take up an offering rather than bring blankets, by the time you go out and buy a blanket, we pay the cost to ship the banklet, because shipping costs are unreal today. They could buy two blankets, so, and they could get the, delivered to the place where it needs. So. Uh, that's why we do it. And we have a short little video just uh, on the Blanket Sunday. So watch this. Moms are amazing. I'm sure your mom was amazing. I'm going to introduce you to my amazing mom. This is my mom, Pauline. She's 90 years young. And she used to wrap me in a blanket. A long time ago. <laughs> and... We continue to, to share blankets with people around the world. Through the Church World Service Blanket Program, we have an opportunity for only $10 to share an act of compassion. I've seen these blankets used in homeless shelters. I've seen them wrapped around refugees. I've seen them handed out at food banks. It's more than just a blanket. It's an act of love. Thank you. Thankfully, we live in a climate where we don't need as many blankets. <laughs> but some people up north, when it gets wintertime, they need lots of blankets. And for those that are homeless, those that are dealing with tragedies and things, they go and they share with that. So if this is something you have a, would like to give to, we thank you. We've, every year we've donated the money to this, so thank you for that. And so now as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings, even though we put them in the baskets, as we let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again we come before you thankful for the goodness you share with us, the blessings you give us, the purpose you have for us, the fact that you never stop thinking about us. You always want the best for us, and we thank you for that. And so, Lord, now as we come to return a portion of all that blessing back to you in the form of these, our tithes and offerings, Lord, use them, bless others with them. Guide us in their use and multiply them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 17th chapter, beginning of the first verse. Hear now these words. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, taking, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a loud voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love this story that Joe Guerrero shares about her daughter when she was five because I think it speaks to all of us. She said, one day she disobeyed me and she had to be punished and sent to her room. Well, she said, after a few minutes, I, I went on to have a talk with her about why she was being punished. And her little daughter, through teary eyes, asked her, why do we do wrong things? And she shared with her daughters that, well, sometimes the devil tells us to do something wrong and we listen to him. We need to learn to listen to God instead. To which her daughter sobbed, but God doesn't talk loud enough. I think there are times in our lives where we think God isn't speaking loud enough to us or clear enough to us. There are times when we would like to hear God just more clearly like speaking to someone face to face. Well, our gospel lesson this morning relates to the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. The Sunday before Lent is the Sunday, the church has remembered this event, and thus today is Transfiguration Sunday. And the story right up to this one in this story is very familiar to many in the church. See, right before this story, if we read, go back a few verses, Jesus had just asked his disciples, who do the people say I am? And the disciples say everything they've said. And then he asked them, but who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. And Jesus says to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'm sure Peter was like, wow, those are good words. <laughs> you like to hear things saying, this is what great things you're going to do. But then we read on just a couple more verses that Jesus begins to tell the disciples that he's going to have to die. Peter doesn't like hearing that and comes up to Jesus and begins to rebuke him. And Jesus now calls him Satan. That's a quick flip from saying, I'm going to give you the kings of heaven to calling you Satan. And I think it's because Peter was struggling with listening to what Jesus was trying to tell him. We like to listen to the good things, but we don't like to listen to the bad things. And then Jesus tells them that some of them standing there will not die before they see Jesus come in all his glory. And right after that, Matthew fulfills that statement by saying six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And every time I read that, I'm like amazed. How did the disciples know this is Moses and Elijah? 
They never got their portrait painted. Nobody made a bronze statue of Moses so you could understand what he looked like down through the ages. They just knew. They were in tune to God enough to know this is Moses and Elijah. But they weren't in tune to every detail going on. Peter takes charge and wants to provide comfort for the three of them. And in doing that, it's a subtle Mary and Martha story as told by Luke. You remember the story? Jesus had visited the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Martha was in the kitchen preparing food, trying to make everything well for everyone's comfort. And Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, just listening to him, not helping out one single bit. And Martha fusses. I'm doing all the work here. And Jesus tells Martha that Mary has chosen the right thing in this moment to listen. And so here on the mountaintop, when Peter tells Jesus he thinks he should make three shelters, they suddenly are surrounded by a cloud, and a voice comes from that cloud saying, This is my son who I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Again, we get a parallel story in Scripture. When Jesus was baptized by John, we read that the heavens opened up, and a voice was heard to say, this is my son whom I loved. With him I am well pleased. The difference in these two stories is when Jesus was baptized, most people believe Jesus was the only one to hear it. Now up on the mountaintop, the three disciples hear the voice. Peter, even in his letter, recounts this encounter. He says, when we were on the mountaintop, we heard the voice of God saying, this is my son whom I love. With I am him I am well pleased. He leaves out the listen to him part. He quotes the baptism voice. See, what he's forgetting sometimes is that on the mountaintop, what they heard was a command. It wasn't a suggestion to the disciples. It wasn't, it would be a good idea if you listened to Jesus. It was... A three-word command, listen to him. And we have to remember that listening is not the same as hearing. If you have kids, you understand that. <laughs> they hear you, but they don't understand you sometimes. And we hear them, but we don't understand them sometimes. See, hearing refers to the sounds that we hear. It's a physical process that pro provided you don't have any hearing problems, which as we get older becomes more of a concern. It happens automatically. Listening, however, requires more than that. It requires focus and a concentrated effort, both mental and sometimes physical as well. Listening means paying attention, not only to the story told, but how it's told, the use of language and voice, how the other person uses his or her body. In other words, it means being aware of both verbal and nonverbal messages. Your ability to listen effectively depends on the degree to which you perceive and understand the message. And listening is not a passive process. In fact, the listener can and should be as at least as engaged in the process as the speaker. And the phrase we use that is for active listening. And that's one of the neat things about a Stephen ministry course. I think about three quarters of the course is just teaching you how to listen, how to actively listen. That's because, as I said, listening is more of a psychological process. Physically, we hear the words, but from there it's all psychological because we must process, interpret the words we hear. Not just the words, but everything that takes in the communication. And there are reasons why we don't listen very well. Some reasons are that we're just too wrapped up in our own thoughts. You ever get that way? Someone's just talking to you and you are miles away. You're thinking about something else, what you got to do later in the day. We're just wrapped up in our own thoughts. Or other times, we're just distracted by something. For some of us, I mean, if you ever get into a party and you're talking to someone and then you hear your name mentioned over in another group and you tune out this person because you want to hear what they're saying, you've now become distracted by something else. We become distracted by things around us. We have already... Um, or the other reason we don't listen is we already have formulated a response to what's being said. The person says a couple things and we already know thinking about how we're going to respond and we stop listening to them because we know the answer. 
or what we are hearing is conflicting with our opinions and we don't want to hear it. This is what happens when Republicans and Democrats get together and they start talking about it. either side says, I don't want to hear it. You're wrong. <laughs> See, example is this is one of the problems is instead of listening closely to what someone said, we often get distracted after a sentence or two and we start to think about what's going on and what we're going to say in a reply. We're thinking about something later in the day. That means we're not fully listening to the rest of the speaker's message. And scientists say the problem is attributed in part to the difference between the average rate we speak and the average rate we process words. See, we speak at about 125 to 175 words per minute. I met people in the South who push that 200 to 250 words a minute. But we process between 400 and 800 words a minute. So when we're listening to somebody, we have extra capacity to think about something else. And we use that extra capacity to think about something else instead of the listener that we're listening to. See, so Richard say this is a common habit to use that spare time to focus on something else. And that is why we must listen intently. Listening requires effort. And we also have to deal with the problem that so often we don't want to hear what we don't want to hear. We don't like that. We don't want to hear we were wrong. We don't want to hear there's a better way. We don't want to hear what we don't want to hear. We only want to hear what we want to hear. We only want to hear the things that we believe in. It's like preaching to the choir. We, we only want to say what everyone already believes. And when we look at this story, it's interesting that Jesus only took Peter, James, and John. And these seem to be his inner circle. There are other times that it's only these three. But these three also showed that they wanted to be in charge. James and John went to Jesus one time and said, when you come into your kingdom, we want to sit on your left and right in the two most powerful positions that they thought of. Peter was always brushing in to take control and take charge. And I think the reason they're up on the mountaintop is because they need to learn what it really means to be in the kingdom of heaven, what it really means to listen. Because heaven flips our world upside down. We don't always understand it. What it means that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. This idea of everything is flipped upside down. We, we need to learn and to listen. And so I think they were there to understand that they need to grow. And the disciples really weren't fully to begin to understand until they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And this is one of the interesting things about listening to God. We need the Holy Spirit in order to listen to God. It is because the Holy Spirit helps us push all those other thoughts out so that we can process the way God is speaking to us and what he is saying to us. But even in listening to God, there are things that keep us from listening to God. One of those things is sin in our lives. See, when we look at a simple definition of sin, sin is whatever separates us from God. And if we are separated from God, it's hard to hear God because we're living in that sin. The second thing is misunderstanding or wrong teaching. And, and this hurts in so many ways. And Jesus warned us that they would be false teachers and not to listen to them. Even our own beliefs about God can get in the way of listening to God because we can say that God only acts this way, and when he acts this way, we don't want to listen. We don't want to think he, he loves or acts that way. A third thing is fear. We can allow our own fears to hear from God. Fears drive out love. Fears paralyze. And we need to remember that love overcomes fear. And in love, we can listen. This is things I tell couples, that when you're talking to each other, especially when I'm talking to them before they get married, and you say something the other doesn't like, remember that person loves you, and they're saying it in love because they want the best for you. They're not saying to put you down, but too often we hear it as a put down. And then there's doubt or lack of faith. If we doubt God, we will not listen to what he says. If we don't believe God could love somebody like me, we won't hear his words of, I love you. We need to remember that God loves us. And then there's pride. This goes a long way with, along with doubt, only in pride. We think we don't need to hear from God because we already know it all. You've met some of those people. I've met some of those preachers. And then there's distractions and being too busy. This is our problem today, the modern church. 
we don't have time for God. We don't set time to pray, to worship, to read, to study, or simply be in God's presence. We become so busy because right after here, we got to go do this. Later in the day, I've got this. This week, I've got this. I've recorded this show. I need to go see here. I've got to go visit this. We are so busy. I think 100 years ago, we were not this busy. But we need to remember to take time to be with God, to hear him. And for some people, it's shame. They want to be with God, but they can't believe God wants to be with them. And so they cover their ears to God's call. And then there's this final thing, listening to others instead of God. In our age of social media and 24-hour news and opinion, we end up listening to a lot of voices. We constantly have to have something in our lives speaking to us. I struggled this for a while. I couldn't be alone. I had to turn the radio on, turn the TV on just to have noise in the house. Now I enjoy going out for a long walk for 45 minutes to an hour without bringing my phone along to listen to anything, to just be with God in my thoughts. It's powerful. See, as we learn to listen to the world around us, it can scare us sometimes. As we forget about how God has been with us and we look at what the world is telling us it's really like, we can forget the joy that's there. It's like this girl, seven years old, her family finally took her to Disney World. And she rode Space Mountain. And she loved Space Mountain. In fact, she had to get online a couple more times to ride Space Mountain because it was a blast. Well, the family came back to Disney World the next year. And as they were waiting in line, she began to read the signs that they have out there, warning how fast this is, warning that it might cause this problem, warning that it might do this. And halfway through the line, she turned to her daddy and said, I don't want to ride the, mount, the space mountain. He's like, why? You loved it last year. And she said, well, this year I can read. <laughs> and she was listening to another voice instead of that voice of her past experience of that joy, that love. See, there are times we need to learn to, learn to listen to God. We have to learn to tune out the world. We need to become active listeners who listen without predetermined knowledge. That when we go before God, we say, I don't know the answer. When we go into scripture, we should go in like, this is the first time I have ever read this passage, even if I've read it a hundred times. Because when you go in that way, you will read and hear new things. You will see things you never saw before because you went into it. I've never seen this before. And to seek wisdom from God, oftentimes we need to do it by praying through the scriptures. We need to use God's words to speak to God, to listen to God. Which sounds kind of backwards because we're speaking in order to listening. But if we want to be active listeners, we need to learn to hear the way God speaks. We need to be able to put to the point that if God called you out, would you be able to say, speak, for your servant is listening? And by using God's own words in prayer, it means we're listening to his words. And the more we use them, the more we'll be able to know them. And the more we know them, the more we'll be able to hear his voice and gain wisdom. And we need to learn to be still. This is hard for a lot of people to sit alone quiet with no agenda, no reading, no talking, no journaling, just being still and listening for God's voice. See, we need to set aside time to listen if we're going to actively listen to God. And when we set those times aside for silence, we have to remember that there are gonna be thoughts that come into our head and that's okay. We can set them aside we need to just empty our mind as those thoughts come in and say, I'll deal with it later. Because it means being quiet with God, saying, speak, for your servant is listening, and then actually listening. And when we seek God first and become active listeners for his voice and his truth, we will find a peace that passes all understanding. We will find a joy for where we are going in life. We all realize that finding answers is more about our relationship with God, our Father, than it is about how quickly we research an answer or find an answer to a particular question. 
that the more we listen to God, the more we are in relationship with God. And while we should praise God for pastors and wise people who write wonderful books and Bible studies, we don't want to rely solely on them. We need to realize that God is speaking to you. And we need to search for him ourselves, not just from me. I hope I stir you to go and to listen. And Diedrich Bonhoeffer gave us one of the greatest reminders about listening to God. He said, the person who can no longer listen to his brother or sister will soon no longer be able to listen to God either. We develop our listening as we listen to one another, as we care about one another, as we listen with that empathy, that openness, that I want to hear from you. When we can do that with one another, we can begin to hear God. We need to listen in love and openness to God's revelation. We're starting Lent this Wednesday, a time of reflection. Lent's 46 days long. It's, it's 40 days of devotion and six mini Easter's. During Lent, I'm going to be talking about for our Sunday messages on these six mini Easter's and Ash Wednesdays, the seven things Christ said on the cross. It was his last words to us before he was taken up to heaven. His last words to those around him, what do they mean? What can we learn from them? I hope you will find that something where you can learn from God and learn to listen to him. But take this Lenten season to learn to listen, to be still, to speak to God through his scripture, to be willing to sit there and say, speak for your servant is listening and see if God does not speak to you more clearly. If during this 40 days of Lent, you come closer to knowing God and the relationship with him, actively listen to God and be amazed at what he tells you. Let us pray. Grace, Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you speak to us in so many wonderful ways. Sometimes it's through dreams and vision. Other times it's through a friend. Sometimes it's through a sunset. Other times it's through a song. We thank you that you are constantly talking to us, leading us, guiding us, loving us. So Lord, help us to hear your love. Because Lord, we want to listen to you. We thank you that you speak to us. And it's in your son's most precious holy name we pray. Amen. Please stand together as we sing our closing song, number 664, sent forth by God's blessing. Sent forth by God's blessing, our true faith confessing, thy people of God from this world. Just a quick reminder, if you would like to schedule an appointment for your pictures, there's still a few, one left on Saturday, several left in March. I'll be back there and can sign you up. And so now let us reach up and grab God's hand, because he's going to walk with you and talk with you. He's going to go and lead you. So go where he goes and follow him hand in hand. Hear his voice and understand his love for you, and then go into the world and share that love. Amen.